in Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 through 33, and then 44 through 46. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its, bur in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. And on finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. May God bless the reading of God's holy word. Please pray with me. Loving God, may your words be heard. Let my words be yours. And let those words penetrate our hearts and our minds so that we may act and speak in your goodness and love. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, our text for today comes from the 13th chapter of Matthew, and that it consists of multiple parables, nine to be exact. And here Jesus is assembling um, a variety of examples of what the kingdom of heaven or God's empire may look like to the average Joe, being those disciples or the curious bystanders that were always gathered around him. And he even provides a bit of commentary for some of those parables. Parables, they were an effective tool that Jesus used to enhance the crowd's understanding of his teachings. And the word parable, it literally means to throw something alongside. It's a comparison placed beside a similar narrative. Now we're familiar with modern day parables. Many of us probably have a favorite illustration from childhood that's been passed down through the generations that a loved one used to apply to teaching a moral or spiritual lesson. And as someone who works with children, I can catch myself here and there assisting students to rise above the negativity and disturbances of life by uh, using a helpful story thrown alongside. It's what Jesus chose to do in the text today. Jesus, he compares the kingdom of heaven, heaven to several concepts. Possibly the parable of the sower, seeds, and weeds, which is just a few verses ahead at the beginning of the chapter, appealed to the farmers in the crowd. And then hearing about mustard seed and bread baking and treasure might have perked the attention of the fishermen, bakers, merchants listening in. Although Jesus accommodated the diverse crowd with various stories to enhance his teaching, the truly most fascinating part of any parable that Jesus delivered was that those who hear, read, or analyze them discover various and separate meanings. So within these four parables, a wealth of information can be gathered on our interpretation of the kingdom of heaven according to Jesus. We all listened to the same reading of the parables moments ago, yet not all of us understand the story similarly due to our backgrounds, our personal life experiences, our beliefs, our individual makeup. It's, it's different, these, these parables. They're, they're more thought-provoking and influential in ways that may be different from the person sitting next to you. Well, that's okay. So let's dive a little deeper into these four stories and consider the many aspects that God reveals about God's loving kingdom. 
So Jesus, he presents the kingdom of heaven as similar to a mustard seed, yeast, treasure in a field, and one pearl. So the issue of size is a component discovered in each story. Jesus emphasizes that the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. And a woman mixes yeast with three measures of flour. Treasure is found in a field and one lone pearl emboldens a person to sell everything. The degree of size, it creates this contrast between a small beginning and a grand ending. Someone took a mustard seed and planted it. And what's produced is the greatest of shrubs where birds make nests of the air or make nests from the air. And this, the smallness of God's empire it began in a tiny baby with a humble birth among barn animals. But that delicate cross child flourished into the powerful affirmation of God's presence on earth, welcoming to all and providing a sustainable existence. In the parable of yeast, flowers mixed with a remnant of fermented dough used as a starter for raising a new batch of dough. Three measures of flour or a whole bushel of flour, that makes a good bit of bread dough. But once the bread, that dough rises and is baked, more than a hundred people can enjoy that bread. That's a lot of bread. Although the leaven's presence in the recipe is small, that leavening process expands the portion greatly. And again, we see Christ suggesting that the kingdom of heaven has a small beginning in him, just one person, confined to one location during a short period of time. But that soon changes as the first Christians who embraced his ministry started the Christian church. And now here we are today. It's much different, isn't it? It's grown. The element of smallness in the appearance of God's kingdom, it continues. If we imagine a field, what comes to mind is this vast, open plot of land. And the treasure, whatever it may be, it's relatively small enough to hide in the field. And a merchant in search for rare, expensive pearls locates just one pearl. In both instances, these modest items, they're so dearly cherished that everything is sold in an effort to purchase these items. The discovery of God's empire, it disrupts ordinary life and our priorities. It demands sacrifice and it's as if that treasure and that pearl have this celestial power over the finder and shapes their lives. Isn't that what God's love and glory does in us? And let us look at the symbolic nature of that mustard tree. Why does Jesus choose a shrub in his analogy? Rather some, some majestic tree like a cedar or an oak or a cypress. In the parable that lowly plant is the unforeseen symbol of the kingdom of God. It's not the extensive branches or the broad trunk of the grandest of trees that fulfill God's will on earth, but the ordinary bush. You know, that's you and me. Those of us who go nameless, never making it into history books, who never reach a million plus followers on social media. We average common folk are sufficient and worthy enough to embody the presence of God here and now. And the same can be said of the aspect of hiddenness that's found in the story of the wheat and the treasure. And in verse 33, Jesus says that a woman took yeast and mixed it in flour. The translation of that word in Greek also means to hide. And Jesus goes on to tell in the parable following that, that the treasure was hidden in a field. 
So in both parables, this hidden element, it's so abundant that it results in this bountiful quantity of bread and an eagerness to sell everything to purchase the field. Although our lives, even the noblest of deeds that we accomplish for the kingdom of God, may seem like a small seed in the grand scheme of things, or even unremarkable, in Christ we flourish and we cultivate an atmosphere of joy and sustenance for the kingdom of God. And then there's the essence of time in each story that's significant for us to appreciate today. We have a room full of people with green thumbs, the greatest gardeners around. And you know that the stages from seed to harvest is anything but a quick process. It takes months of hard, sweaty work preparing for that end result, which for many of you is this overwhelming amount of produce where there's no space to hold you end up giving most of it away. Thanks, Patsy. Time, it's an enduring friend, yet one with which we easily become impatient. Reading through these four parables, it's easy to just skim over the words and ignore the importance of time. Jesus does not actually mention time by name or its process specifically, but it's there. In verse 32, talking about the mustard seed, Jesus says, but when it has grown, it's the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree. Have you ever planted a tree and watched it grow to that enormous presence in the yard? My mother, she always tells as a young child of her helping my papa plant an oak tree in the front of their yard. And if you know where my grandmother Shirley lives, you know about this tree. It's huge. At all parts of the day, there's adequate shade. And if you know the age of my mother, then you may have an idea of how old this oak tree is. It took years, many years, time for it to reach maturity. And then there's a woman who mixes yeast with flour and can feed the whole community. As a chubby child growing up, there was nothing more exciting than to see that glass Pyrex on top of the kitchen counter. That cylindrical bottle with the yellow airtight top held the glorious liquid that would soon become loaves of bread. And on any ordinary day, that container was in the back, carefully stored in the refrigerator. But once a week, if we Haynes girls were lucky, mother would prepare that starter for baking. Instant potato flakes were put in the mixture and it would cause it to bubble. And I can still hear that wooden spoon bouncing along that glass as she stirred. The mixture in the bottle had to sit for a few hours so that it would become room temperature. Then mom would mix flour, sugar, oil, with that starter liquid and create the dough. Then the dough went through the first process of rising for 12 hours inside this large glass greasy bowl. And once that fluffy dough heaped over the top along the sides of that bowl, mother divided it into three equal mounds and she put them in these dark brown baking bread pans. And then the dough only needed to rise for another eight hours, which was like an eternity. It was torture for us chubby children. It was difficult finding activities to pass the time away. I always found my way back to those pans, trying to watch that bread just rise, that dough get larger and larger. And then finally, the dough was ready, the eight hours complete, the oven temperature set, and the bread placed in the oven. My sister and I would watch through, we'd peek through the oven doors, watching that golden brown color come about on that dough. And soon the timer sounded. The smell filled the house as mother would brush melted butter along the steamy loaves. And we knew what was next. More waiting. 
The bread had to cool. But when the sound of that 1984 model electric knife resonated from the kitchen, it even caused disturbances on the television at times. I don't know how. But that meant it was time to devour these sweet slices. There was no need for any condiments. It was good enough to eat at as is. And all this bread talk and even mustard makes me want a sandwich for, break, for lunch. But if you've ever made bread, you understand that the process is not as quick or as easy as Jesus describes in verse 33. Time, it's a valuable component. And in the last two parables, those who found those precious objects, they sold everything to purchase those items, to have it in their possession. So let's think about it. Imagine for a moment all the property that you own. Think about it. Every article of clothing, your furniture, vehicles, your house, all the items packed away in storage bins, and for some of us, Christmas decorations. It's a lot of stuff. Now imagine the time it would take to organize all that, sell it to the appropriate buyer for the right amount of money you'd probably have a difficult time letting go of some of those items with sentimental value. But it all has to go. Time is tricky that way. Time involves patience, courage, and even uncertainty. French philosopher and Catholic priest Pierre Teilhard de Chardin once said, above all, trust in the slow work of God. We are quite naturally impatient in everything to reach the end without delay. We should like to skip the intermediate stages. We're impatient of being on the way to something unknown, something new. And yet it's the law of all progress that it is made by passing through some stages of instability. And that may take a very long time. Above all, trust in the slow work of God. The slow work of God. I believe that's a suitable definition for time. Through the slow work of God, wounds heal, physical and emotional. Grief becomes less painful and more of a gentle presence. Spiritual growth and depth can only develop slowly as God works in and through us. In time, we become more knowledgeable in our perspectives on life and God progresses and deepens. In the slow work of God, forgiveness is achieved and love prevails. Place your trust in time, that work that slowly God provokes in our hearts and minds and souls. And lastly, Let's look at verses 44 through 46 one more time. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid, and then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, and on finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, Jesus is a bit vague here. He doesn't describe in detail at all what that treasure is. I don't know about you, but I want to know what that treasure was. What is he talking about? Is it gold, diamonds, homemade gooey brownies? What was it? And I'm no mineralogist, but what was so unique about that one pearl? Maybe Jesus doesn't say, because the specifics that matter to us simple humans are quite different for our mysterious, all-knowing God. Could it be that Jesus was suggesting that he is the one who found treasure? That is God's people in that crowd that day. Or upon looking, he found that each one there, each individual searching and longing for understanding, acceptance, and compassion was the one pearl the same could be said for us now. Here in this room and those beyond these four walls, 
God sees treasure in us all.